God doesn't have any problem. Man has a lot of problems. How can God judge man? What does he know about man? It's unfair for God to judge man. And there comes the judge, and the judge is a man. That's why the Bible says that because he is a man, God gave him the authority to be the judge. One John chapter four, and let me read to you from verse sixteen to eighteen. And we have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love, and he who abides in love abides in God, and God in Him. Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have bold. Uh, we may have boldness in the day of judgment because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect, fear, uh, perfect love casts out fear because fear involves torment. But he who fears has not been made perfect in love. Verse 16 to 18 is probably one of the most interesting uh, portions uh, uh, in the whole uh, epistle. Um, I showed you how the epistle of 1 John is so important in when we consider the topic of loving one another. Being an old man who's seen the birth, the growth, and the spread of the church in the first century, writes in his very ripe old age as a great pastor. He writes and he writes things that he finds as very important, being led and guided by the Holy Spirit. And love has a very important place in that in his writing. So that's why we have chosen this book and cover, uh, chosen to cover certain portions in this uh, episode. Now in this uh, particular portion that I just read to you, verse 16 to 18, there are some results or consequences of dwelling in love that he mentions, particularly three consequences. I want to pay attention to the third one, basically, the first two. Uh, are already covered or it will be covered once again under the third point. When we come to the third point, we'll deal with it also. But we are mainly interested in the third point today. But I want to first mention the first two. 
he's talking about the results or consequences of dwelling in love, living in love. What is the result? What are the consequences of dwelling in love? He puts it in this way. From what I just read to you, we can say it this way. First of all, he says, the first consequence is to dwell in love is the final proof of the fact that God dwells in us and we dwell in God. That's the result. That is the benefit you get from dwelling in love. Uh, dwelling in love. It serves as the final proof that you dwell in God and God dwells in you. So, uh, there needs to be no doubt about where you are spiritually, what condition you are spiritually. You know, when you live in love, you can be sure that uh, you are truly in God and God is in you. The reason is this. Once again, we come back to the same thing. Love is something foreign to natural human nature. When I say that, I say that divine love is foreign to the natural human nature. The kind of love the Bible talks about, the agape love, is totally foreign to the natural human nature. In the natural human nature, there is a kind of love that is basic animal instinct. Even a chicken loves its little ones. A dog loves its puppies. Pig also loves its little ones, you know. It's a natural thing. It is natural love. It is affection. Love based on some basic animal instinct. But the Bible is not talking about that kind of a thing. That all of us also have. The same animal instinct is part of us. The Bible, when it talks about love here, when John talks about it here, he's talking about this love called the divine love or the agape love, the love that comes from God. Love is of God, he says. It comes from Him. God has poured His love into our hearts. So if you're loving and dwelling in love and living in love, showing love to one another, particularly loving the unlovable, because it is natural animal instinct to love your own, love your little ones, love your family, love all those you love, love all those that, are, that seem right for you. It is very natural. But when you love the unlovable, when you love the unworthy, when you love the most difficult people, when you love those who do things against you, that is a different kind of love. When you have that love, that, he says, is final proof that you are in, dwelling in God and God is dwelling in you. Unless God is dwelling in you and you are dwelling in God, you cannot do that. Without God being in you, in your life, you cannot do that. All right? Secondly, the second thing is this, this love toward one another is proof of the fact that God's love is perfected in us. You know, the whole purpose of God saving us forgiving us our sin and all of that, is not just so that we can be forgiven and be worthy to go to heaven. See, we have reduced it to that. Very sad that Christians have reduced this whole great salvation, as the book of Hebrews calls it, to something very uh, small, feeble, to nothing, basically. Forgiveness of sin is important. It's the grand beginning. It's not the end. It's not the ultimate. The ultimate purpose of God saving us is not forgiveness of sin and going to heaven. The ultimate purpose is so that we might become like Him. Romans 8 mentions that, that we can be changed into the very image of God's Son. That's the ultimate purpose. And uh, that is why Jesus died, that's why He saved us and so on. Now, Titus puts it in the book of Titus. Paul puts it very beautifully there in one verse. I want to read it. Titus chapter 2, verse 14, says, Who gave himself for us, it's talking about Christ giving himself for us on the cross, that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. See, the purpose of, of saving us is not just to forgive us our sins and tomorrow to take us to heaven. It is to purify for himself his own special people. He delivered us from all lawlessness, from all sin, 
sinful deeds and all of that. He delivered us from it. Why? Not so we can go around saying, I used to do this, but now I don't do that. No, that's not the purpose. See, holiness is presented in negative form by many people. They say, I used to smoke, drink, do this, that, and now I stopped. That's not holiness. That's the, that's the one part of holiness. Glad you stopped doing all those things. But the thing is, that's not holiness is. Holiness is becoming like Christ. Am I like Christ? That's what holiness is. Holiness must be presented positively. So what he's saying is, he redeemed us from every lawless deed. Why? So to purify for himself his own special people. Look at the words employed here. His own special people is translated in some older translations as peculiar people. Now we've taken this word pe peculiar and uh, tried to be as peculiar as possible. Back in the old days, uh, we thought uh, the more peculiar you are, the more spiritual you are. So peculiarity consisted, we thought, uh, in what we wore, what we didn't wear, and you know, what color clothing we wore, and, wore, and all that business. You know, we, we emphasized that a whole lot. And we had a one-track mind. We thought like that. I used to think like that. And that's what peculiar people means. You know, we are different from the world, you know. Uh, peculiar, different people, you know. But now I realize that's not what peculiar is all about. The, w the way we are peculiar, called to be peculiar, is this. We are called to be like Jesus. Jesus was totally a different person when he was in this world. There was none like him. The love that he showed, you could see in nobody else. He's the only one that had this divine love, this capacity to love the unlovable, love even his enemies. He's the only one that demonstrated. That's why in Greek language, they did not even have a word to describe his love. They had love for a mother's uh, love for a child. They had love for a husband's love for his wife. They had another Greek word for a friend's love for another friend of his. But they did not have a word to describe the love that Jesus demonstrated. It was something new. His love was totally different. He loved the unlovable, unlikable. <laughs> he loved uh, those that are unworthy. He loved even his enemies. He said, if you love only those that love you, what good have you done? Even the tax collectors do it, he says. The sinners of the day did it, he said. You love your enemies, he says. So that love was not seen. He was peculiar, very special person, a unique person in a world full of people that did not have this capacity to love the enemy. He had the capacity to love the enemies. He was a completely different, peculiar, special person. Now, when he went to heaven, he wanted to leave here a group of people that is peculiar. That's what it's saying here. He saved us delivered us from all those lawless deeds, good, but for what? So that he can make for himself, purify for himself a special people, his own special people, a peculiar people, zealous for good works. Amen? So, so this, is, this is what uh, Christian life is all about. This is what sanctification is all about. It's becoming like Christ. So when you dwell in love, it is proof that love is being perfected in you, that the work is happening inside of you, that you're progressing, that you are being formed and shaped into the very image of God's Son. That work is going on. You're a child of God. God is at work in you through His Word and through the Holy Spirit, forming you and shaping you, making you into the very image of His Son. All right, now let's go to the third one. The third uh, result is that we may have boldness and have no fear in the day of judgment. You find that in 1 John chapter 4, verse 17. The love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. This is where I want to concentrate. That we may have boldness in the day of judgment and everything else in verse 18 and so on must be looked at in relationship to this statement one of the things that dwelling in love does is this one of the consequences or results is this that you end up having boldness as you contemplate the day of judgment when you think about the judgment the day of judgment that's coming 
What do you think about it? Now we are entering into a subject that's very interesting. The day of judgment. Right? That is a biblical subject that is there from the beginning to the end. It's a, there's a lot mentioned about the day of judgment. Now, some people don't even believe in a day of judgment. They think judgment is where you die and, and, and uh, that's it, you know. That's your judgment. You die, you know. Nothing more after that. Uh, they see nothing beyond death. But the Bible speaks about a particular day of judgment, a great event. The Bible talks about, about it as an event that will happen at the end of the world, at the end of time, and it talks about it as something that is formal, something that is public, and something that is final. Judgment is a formal event. Just like we have a meeting, this is a formal event. Sunday morning service at AFT, right? You know there is a Sunday morning service at AFT at 11.30. So that's why you're here. It's a formal event. We didn't just gather in here because we just thought we'll just drop in by church and, and, and just sing a few songs and if anybody's preaching, we'll just hear. No, there will be singing, there will be prayer, there will be preaching. It's a formal event. It's a scheduled event, right? Judgment is like that. Judgment Day is a scheduled, formal event, public event. It's a final thing. Now, some say, again, you know, there is no public, there is no really particular day of judgment as such, they say. Now, um, I need to explain this a little bit. The Bible always talks about judgment as a formal event, a particular day. Think about it. I'll try to be as brief as possible. The Bible talks about God sitting on the throne. God is the great judge sitting on the throne. And the books being opened, right? And uh, investigation made, looked into. There is stuff entered into the book. It's being no, uh, considered. And then judgment issued, sentencing is done, you know. And the Bible is very specific in many places. I'll just read a couple of verses here for you. The Bible particularly talks about how God has given the responsibility and the honor of judging the world to Jesus Christ. Look at chapter 5 in John's Gospel. John's Gospel, chapter 5 and verse 27. Look at this. And as give I'm giving you this because a lot of people say there is no day of judgment. There is no such thing beyond death. Death is the final thing. There is nothing beyond death. I need to impress upon you that there is a day. The Bible teaches that. Then only I can show you how living in love frees you from the fear of the day of judgment and gives you boldness about the day of judgment. That's our topic, you know. It frees you. Love frees you from the day of judgment, uh, from the fear of judgment and gives you boldness as you contemplate the day of judgment. First, let's establish the fact that there is a judgment and something is going to happen as a formal public event. Verse 26 onwards. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son to have life in himself and has given him authority to execute judgment also because he is the Son of Man. Now look at the way it said, because he is man. Literally, that's what it means. Because Jesus is man, he has given him authority to execute judgment, it seems. Because he is man. Now, I heard many years ago, I heard a wonderful preacher who explained this most beautifully. He said on the judgment day, he described what the scene will look like on the judgment day. He said there was a great crowd great throng of people, multitudes and multitudes, tens and tens of thousands of people gathered in the presence of God. And uh, they were all talking. There was a great noise, like the, uh, like, the, uh, like the sea in uproar. People are expressing something uh, uh, there as they were gathered there. What they were expressing was this. They knew that they are gathered there for judgment. It was judgment day. And the judge is supposed to appear. And they're all questioning the right of this judge to judge them. They say, well, how can he judge us? He never lived in our world. He never went through the problems that I went through. He never uh, went to work. 
you know he lived in a he never lived in an unjust world you know he never uh, he was never treated badly uh, he never faced all the problems that i faced he was never bullied he was never treated bad nobody ever did anything like he's living in heaven he's transcendent he's he's all by himself there he's far removed from all my troubles he doesn't know anything about my trouble that i go through in this world then what right does he have to judge me and tell me that i'm wrong for doing certain things that i'm wrong for lying and i'm wrong for stealing i'm wrong for doing this and i'm wrong. in my situation because i am in such trouble i am in such a bad world sometimes you got to lie sometimes you got to steal sometimes you got to do things that are not right because you live in a world like that how can he judge what right does he have to judge us this is the topic that's going on they're all talking to one another and all of a sudden there comes the judge and there was a big hush complete silence why because the judge happens to be a man they were whole whole time they were arguing how can a god judge man god doesn't know anything about man's problem god is in heaven man is on earth god doesn't have any problem man has a lot of problems how can god judge man what does he know about man it's unfair for god to judge man and there comes the judge and the judge is a man that's why the bible says that because he is a man god gave him the authority to be the judge god wants the man to judge do you know that when jesus came into the world is a second person of trinity but took on humanity and came in human flesh but when he died and rose again he did not give up his humanity christian teaching shows very clearly that when he rose again he did not give up is the humanity the bible says that we are one mediator between god and man the man jesus christ he is still man the man jesus christ the one that is seated at the right hand of god is man the man who showed his wounds to thomas the man who had a resurrected body a body that cannot be destroyed the same body but resurrected body which we will all have the man who retained his humanity his human nature totally he did not forsake his humanness he retained his humanness till this day he retains it till the end he will retain it that is i think one of the greatest honors given to human nature that jesus christ has taken it on to himself so no don't ever curse human nature don't ever curse humanity it has been honored through jesus christ he took on human nature at his death and his resurrection he did not give up his human nature he chose to retain the human nature he is there as a man so when the judgment day comes the bible says there will be a man and there was a great hush he says this man who describes the scene says there was a great hush why the great hush because they were saying how can god judge man what does god know about man's problem has gone gone through all these problems that i go through and all of that and here they find here is a man about whom the bible says that he was tempted in every way as we were in other words he's gone through this world lived in this world went to work lived in a family faced the difficulties and problems faced the false accusations of people faced the people talking bad about him torturing him taunting him killing him ultimately faced all these troubles he lived in an unjust evil world and faced unkindness every day in this world lived as a normal human being in this world working earning doing business and so on yet he was without sin here is a man who's perfect without sin never sinned he lived in this world unbelievable how can you live in this world and live sinlessly people think it's impossible and here is a man that lived in this world but yet lived sinlessly Jesus you were so good Jesus you were so good There's nothing to fear cuz I'm here in your presence Jesus you were so good Jesus, you are so, so good, and I just want to thank you with every beat of my heart. Jesus, you are so good. 
Jesus, you are so good. There's nothing to fear, cause I'm here in your presence. Jesus, you are so good. Jesus, you are so, so good. And I just want to thank you with every beat of my heart. You've given me eternal life. To light my way, you've given me spirit. With new mercies every day, Jesus, you are so good. Jesus, you are so good. There's nothing to fear, cause I'm here in your presence. Jesus, you are so good. Jesus, you are so, so good. Thank you in every beat. You've given me eternal life. You've given me eternal life. And your word to light my way. You've given me spirit. With new mercies every day. Jesus, you are so good. Jesus, you are so good. You are so good, Jesus. You are so, so good, and I just want to thank you with every beat of mine. You've given me confidence, you've given me a confidence, and my soul is filled with peace. You are my provider, you supply my every need. Jesus, you are so good. You are so good. There's nothing to fear, cause I'm here in your presence. Jesus, you are so good. Jesus, you are so, so good. And I just want to thank you with every beat of my heart. I just want to thank you. Oh, I just want to thank you with every beat of my heart. I just want to thank you. I just want to thank you. I just want to thank you with every beat of my heart. Amen.